Frank Starr Bond and his brother Walter were the first missionaries who brought the Adventist message to Spain. One of 12 children, Frank was born in the United States into a large Californian family. He earned a degree in theology in 1899 from Healdsburg College, now Pacific Union College. At a camp meeting in Fresno, Pastor Arthur G. Daniels, the president of the General Conference, called for volunteers to go preach the Adventist message in new territories. Frank and Walter volunteered because they had worked among Hispanics in Arizona and Nevada and had some knowledge of the Spanish language. They were sent to be the first to preach the Adventist message in Spain. Frank was 27 when they arrived in Barcelona in 1903. Before long, they moved to the city of Sabadell, where they established a school. Missionary work, Cole Porter ministry, and public lectures soon bore fruit, and three people were baptized. Two years after his arrival, Frank fell ill with smallpox and had to return to the United States. One year later, he returned to Spain healthy and now married to Martha M. Farnsworth. Soon after, Frank was ordained to the ministry. He moved with his family to the province of Teruel, where he baptized several families the following year. Their descendants would later become pastors. In 1912, Frank helped establish the first two churches in Spain the first in Barcelona, and the second in Jerica. While living in eastern Spain, Frank and Martha had a daughter, and two years later, a son. Frank became the second president of the Spanish mission and worked in Spain until 1923, when exhausted from work and sick, he returned to the United States. After a life of service, which included pastoring and evangelizing, he died in Fresno, California on April 25, 1924. Frank Starr Bond and his family's legacy is still felt in Spain, where today there are more than 17,000 Adventists. However, an increasing number of people in this country claim no religion at all. Please pray for the work in Spain as Adventists spread a message of hope. To read the entire story about Frank Starr Bond and other articles, visit the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at encyclopedia.adventist.org. Good morning, Sabbath School. I see it on the screen, but I don't see it up there. <laughs> We're going to talk about creation critics. Have you ever had anybody question you about the story of creation? Yes. yes, I have, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I need you to see it, too. <laughs> Let's try to make that happen. There you go. There we go. Just like that. Mrs. White has a lot to say about this, and I'd like you to uh, get out your book of education and read page 128. Now, if you do not have a book of education, uh, Google has it for you, and you can just type in education, Ellen White, page 128, and it'll pop right up. So it's not an excuse. So here's what she says about creation critics. Inferences errorlessly drawn from facts observed in nature have somehow, uh, however, led to supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in the effort to restore harmony, interpretation of scriptures have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the Mosaic record of creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. She goes on to say, such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. 
The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with teaching of nature. Of the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record, the evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis 1.5. And the same in substance is said of each of the first six days of creation week. Each of these periods of inspiration declares to have been a day consisting of evening and morning, like every other day since that time. In regard to the work of creation itself, the divine testimony is, He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalms 33, 9. With him who could thus call into existence unnumbered worlds, how long a time would be required for the evolution of the earth from chaos? In order to account for his works, must we do violence to his word? So here we go. Creation versus evolution. Can you answer these questions if somebody asked you? The earth is a million years old. Could you answer that? Humans evolved from ape-like ancestors. Genesis doesn't matter, just the New Testament. If you believe in creation, then you don't believe in science. Oh, we've heard that one before, haven't we? Well, that gets us back to studying our Bible because the Bible is our foundation. And if we can pull it out of the archives and dust it off, we can then find the truth. So what sets My, my numbers here. Okay, there we go. Mm-hmm. So what does it really matter if the days of creation were 24 hours? I am asked. So messages like these questions persuade material we read it shows, uh, it's in shows we watch, the news we listen to, even Christian leaders mix millions of years of evolution into Genesis creation account. At every turn, we're bombarded with ideas, opinions, memes, mixed messages, misinformation, advocating an evolutionary worldview. Trying to detangle uh, facts from the fiction in these uh, messages can be very frustrating, if not outright intimidating. As humans, who will, uh, we will never be able to understand everything, and how can we know what to believe? Who do we trust in our authority for truth, and where can we find a reliable starting point to understand these difficult topics? Here's the good news. There is a starting point that we can trust from the beginning to the end, and it's God's word. Daunting questions become far simpler to answer when we base our thinking on the true foundation, the Bible. And the firmest foundation of truth is Scripture. When we accept God's Word as is written, we have a surefire starting point for reasoning about the world, including these difficult questions. So, does it matter if there is a literal 24-hour day or not? Some Christian believes that millions, Christians, mind you, not atheists, not evolutionists, Christians believe that there are millions to billions of years elapsed during this six-day creation week in Genesis 1. But if you're honest, this belief does not come from the straightforward reading of God's Word. It comes by inserting human ideas, the story of evolutionary origins, from outside the Bible into Scripture. God can reveal truth through His Word because He hardwired humans to understand language. From day six of creation, language allowed Adam to receive God's instructions, name animals, and communicate with Eve. Words carry specific meanings in specific contexts 
making communication possible. Accordingly, Genesis is written in plain language for everybody, ordinary or scholarly, to understand and teach their children. For example, uh, Genesis 1.5 plainly reveals that after God created light, he called um, light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. The account of uh, the days two through six follow a similar pattern, associating each day with an evening, morning, and a number. When God finished creating, he rested on his own number, seven. How do we know that these days were literal 24 hours? Well, like the English word, For day is yom. And does it mean a 24-hour period? Well, it can mean an interval uh, daylight as opposed to night, a specific time, an era, a, a year. And as in English, the word's meaning is clear from its context. Every other instance when the Old Testament mentions yom, the word for 24-hour period, it means evening, morning, or number. Yom means ordinary day. Well, if it's everything in the rest of the Bible, wouldn't it be correct to assume that that's what it is in Genesis? Had God meant to communicate that he created over long periods of time, he certainly could have, but he didn't tell us that. <clears throat> we have no reason to second-guess God's plain revelation. Jesus and New Testament writers viewed Genesis as history. Careful evaluation of the text affirms Genesis was written as history. If Genesis 1 is the only passage which we think day means something entirely different from its context, that's a surefire sign that something's wrong with our interpretation of God's word. Not the passage itself. We have every reason to make God's word infallible from starting to think how we see this. When we do, the meaning of yom becomes clear as day. What sets humans apart from other animals? Well, according to evolution and the origin story, humans are animals in every sense. Living accidents with no purpose but surviving to perpetuate their meaninglessness. Human morals are an animal invention. Human love is an animal instinct. Human rights are a type of animal rights. Abortion, eugenics, slavery, and genocide flow logically from this evolutionary worldview. God's word, however, reveals a far different picture of human rights, and therefore, human meaning. According to Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In his image of God, he created him. Man, male, and female, he created them. Only two? I thought there were 50 types of sexes. <clears throat> that word image, which uh, is in Genesis 1.26, clarifies to mean in likeness of, refers to the capacities that God gave humans as reflection of himself. As God image bearers, we are able to make free decisions to appreciate immaterial concepts like beauty, truth, logic, and to be in a relationship with God and one another. We can reason, we can discover, we can philosophize, we can create, we can communicate, and we can love. Sin has corrupted God's image in us, but no hazard of our uh, sin-broken world, including disability, deformity, and death, can negate our image of God in us. Amen. Being specially created in God's image sets us apart from the animals. While God's image is spiritual, we see it reflected in certain physical traits unique to humans. Unlike apes, for instance, 
Humans possess both hardware, specialized vocal organs, like I'm using right now to talk, and software, neural programming, for language. And while chimps can mimic some human behaviors, our brains are far more complex than chimp brains, providing a scaffold for reasoning and rela uh, relating as only an image bearer of God can do. Other physical, mental, and genetic differences between humans and apes uh, further affirm that we're unique creatures rather than evolutionary offshoots. But it is our spiritual natures that truly distinguish us as image bearers with rational, redeemable souls. Unlike evolution, this biblical view supplies a foundation for human rights because every human is made in God's image. Every human life has meaning, value, dignity. Fashioned in God's image, humans are priceless in every sense. So if evolution isn't true, what's the history behind all the diversity in living things? Well, with God's word as our starting point, we have a firm foundation for understanding the world, including its kaleidoscope of living things. Where did biological diversity come from? Well, the answer first appears in Genesis 1, and it's referred to 10 times in, uh, to God creating living things according to their kinds. The word kind resurfaces in Genesis 6, recording how two of every kind of land animal and seven male and seven female clean animals entered into God's Noah's Ark. Consequently, these animals could fulfill God's plan for them to repopulate the earth after Genesis. And we see this in Genesis 8, 17. The connection between kind and reproduction suggests that the kinds represent the broadest group of organisms that can reproduce among themselves. Dogs, cats, horses, for instance, have reproduced among themselves to yield an immense variety of dogs, cats, and horse breeds. But dogs cannot cross with cats or horses because they're different kinds. Instead, dogs will always produce, drum roll please, dogs. So, where did all the variety with kinds come from? Like wolves, jackals, and chihuahuas within the dog kind. Biblically, we infer that uh, God created living things with genetic diversity that can be combined in different ways to reveal incredible variation within kinds. For example, the dogs that exited the ark would have had the genetics potentially to produce all the variety of dogs we see today. As dogs spread around the world, Processes like natural selection acted on dogs' genetics diversity by favoring genes best suited to specific environments. Resulting in traits like genes for long hair in cold climates and short hair in hot climates. Natural selection short, uh, uh, sorts pre-existing DNA but does not create new genetic material. Neither do mutations, which really are just a mistake in the DNA. For instance, mutations can alter pre-existing genes to produce curly-headed dogs, but they do not provide novel genes for feathers instead of fur. But the evolution of all living things from common ancestors would at some point require creation of new genes, as evolution says. Natural selection and mutation result in the loss or alterating of existing ge genetic information, not the gain of new material needed to change one kind of creature into another. Though often considered a driving force of evolution, natural selection is not synonymous with evolution. We observe natural selection happening today, and we do not and cannot observe molecules to man evolution, as they claim. Genetic data does not support evolutionary origins, 
but it's consistent with biblical models. Ultimately, <clears throat> ultimately, the diversity of living things provide a world, real world view example of why the Bible should be the foundation of our thinking. So cats stay to cats, dogs stay to dogs. They haven't seen them cross over in what the evolution says billions of years. They're looking for that missing link and they will not find it because it's not there. How do we know Adam was a real person? So here, here's the current sport going on in evangelical circles. Scholars are wrestling a literal Adam out of scripture to make room for evolution. Contestants will call Adam a symbol, a myth, a representative from an early tribe. <clears throat> Anything besides the first man whose disobedience brought sin and death into creation. The goal is to appear scientific, but ironically, observations from genetic uh, confirm the Bible teaching is correct. <clears throat> so what does it teach about origins? <clears throat> Genesis explains that on day six of creation week, God formed Adam out of the dust from the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Genesis 2, 7. Knowing that it, did not, it was not good that man should be alone, Genesis 2, 18, God also fastened Eve from Adam's side. This account leaves no room for evolution. For instance, we can't, uh, uh, we can't assume that dust means ape-like ancestors because a consequence of Adam's sin was he was returned to dust, Genesis 3.19. We also can't call Adam a tribal representative because Genesis 2, 5 to 18, revealed that until God created Eve, no humans existed besides Adam. Other passages throughout scripture clearly portray Adam and Eve as the first humans. Genealogies in First Chronicles and in the book of Luke name Adam the ancestor of other historical fig figures, including Abraham, David, Jesus, and Jesus himself indirectly referenced Adam and Eve when exp uh, explaining God's design for marriage from the beginning, Matthew 19, 4-6. Paul confirms that all humans descended from one man, that's in Acts 17, 26, through whom death spread to all humans, Romans 5, 12, and in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul emphasizes that a real Adam committed a real sin leading to real death for humanity, which explains why Jesus, as Adam's descendant, died a real death, providing salvation for whoever believes, John 3.16. The gospel <clears throat> significance traces back to a literal Adam. Only faith in Jesus, whom Paul called the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, brings salvation. But if we reject the first Adam, we've compromised our logic basis for accepting the last Adam. Accordingly, some writers have reinterpreted the gospel to uh, accommodate evolution, saying that contrary to the Bible's core salvation message, Jesus' death had nothing to do with paying for our sin. Well, we see that in the Jewish faith, we see that in the Muslim faith, and unfortunately, we may see that in the Adventist faith. Wrestling against Adam means wrestling against the gospel. So, let's hold fast to God's word, making no room for compromise. So, if everybody descended from Adam and Eve, why are there so many people groups around the world? An unspeakable, beautiful day will come, according to Revelation 7-9, when believers from every nation, tribe, and language will worship together at the Creator's throne. Individuals of all shapes, sizes, skin colors, hair types, and eye colors will praise the Savior as one. <clears throat> What's the history behind the human physical diversity we see in heaven and currently observe on earth? Well, God's word clearly teaches that all human descendants came from one couple, Adam and Eve, 
And that is in Genesis 3.20 and 1 Corinthians 15.45. After the fall, their genetics grew extremely evil, except for Noah and his family, whom God spared from the flood. When Noah's descendants <coughs> uh, rejected God's plan for humans to spread through the earth, God separated them into different groups by language at the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. This history helps us understand where variations among different uh, people groups originated because <clears throat> any, everyone alive today descended from Noah's family and ultimately from Adam and Eve. These biblical ancestors must have had the genetic potential for all the variations we see in humans today. They had genetic variations that, when combined in different ways among their descendants, could produce offspring with diverse traits. For instance, suppose Adam and Eve had middle, dark, uh, middle brown skin, resulting from the gene variants for both light and dark skin. Different combinations of these variants would easily have produced all the skin tones we see today. When humans dispersed from Babylon, or Babel, the human gene pool divided as well. Different traits became dominant in different groups, giving us the diversity of people around the world. Cultures use these differences to, categor to categorize people into races. Well, while categorization of this occurred way before Darwin, his ideas spawned a new level of horrendous discrimination against races deemed less evolved. However, the concept of races is neither biblical or scientific. Can I say that again? The concept of races is neither biblical or scientific. Amen. Genetic studies confirm that the difference between any two humans far surpass any tiny degree of variation that we sometimes call races. And the idea of races does not stem from Scripture, which teaches that all humans share one blood, Acts 17, 26, we all descended from one man, have equal value as God's image bearers, and equally need Jesus as our Savior. <clears throat> so, if a loving God exists, why is the world full of death and suffering? Well, from our earliest introductions to suffering, pain, and the reality of death, we Christians keenly feel the world's brokenness. Why is our world full of sorrow, especially if a loving God created it? This vexing question has no answer apart from God's holy word. The scripture reveals that God did not create a world of death and suffering. Instead, it is from the beginning, God called it very good, Genesis 1.31. God can call something good because his character is the source of both absolute goodness and absolute truth. But if everything evolved without God, then we have no consistent foundation for defining what's good or evil. And that's what we see today. They said, my reality is what's right and wrong. And for considering death and suffering a problem, after all, an evolutionary worldview says death is a necessary part of life, with the fittest being especially apt to survive. But according to Genesis, animals haven't always needed to kill or outcompete each other for survival. In fact, God's originally ordained humans and land animals to be vegetarian. Genesis 1, 29 to 30. Being a carnivore, suffering and, and death had a, no place in a perfect creation. What changed? Well, Genesis 2, 16 to 17, recounts that God had forewarned Adam, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat it, you shall surely die. Death is the inevitable result of severing ourselves from God, the giver and sustainer of life. Romans 5, 12 explains that death spreads to all humans, through Adam's sin. This sin affects all physical creation. Romans 8.22. Over which God gave humans dominion. Genesis 1.26. We now see sin's effect, including thorns, death, and disease throughout the world. We even see it in the fossil record. <clears throat> For instance, dinosaur fossils show evidence of combat, of eating each other, of even cancer. 
<clears throat> and fossils themselves represent dead things. These fossils could not have been deposited millions of years before Adam's sin. Otherwise, death and suffering would have uh, belonged to the world, which God declared very good. This would undermine God's character, especially if he used death-driven evolution to create. Like atheists, atheists worldwide, theistic evolution, the belief that God used evolution cannot answer the question of suffering. A biblical worldview, however, recognizes that death and suffering are problems. Satan is to blame, not God. Yet Jesus lovingly took sin's effect on himself, paying its, pen its penalty on behalf of sinners. We still encounter trouble in our sin-broken world, John 16, 33, but we have hope because Jesus promised to be with us even unto the end when he'll make creation whole again. So what does this have to do with the gospel, creation? <clears throat> well, the ultimate point of answering questions like, did Adam exist or how did life's diversity or originate isn't uh, to win the arguments. It's to strengthen our faith and to remove intellectual barriers to the gospel. The gospel refers to the good news of Jesus, death and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. We can better understand and therefore proclaim the significance of these events when we see them as a part of the bigger picture of history from Genesis to Revelation. This gospel history begins with the Holy Creator fashioning a perfect world, Adam's rebellion destroying that perfection, separating all humans from the life giver, God. As a result, every descendant of Adam is destined to physical and spiritual death. That's the bad news. <clears throat> but the good news is that God loved the world so much, even in the sin broken state, that he had a plan to restore creation to himself. Only ascendant sinless descendant of Adam, one who could both fully be God and fully be human, could reconcile man and humanity by paying sin's death penalty. So Jesus, the creator himself, stepped into creation. Amen. He paid its sin penalty on the cross, offering to exchange our sin for his righteousness if we come to him. Then he rose from the grave, triumphing over death, so that we could live reconciled to him through Jesus forever. All physical creation, in fact, will be reconciled to God when he creates the new heavens and new earth, restored to its original perfection. The good news of the gospel makes sense in the context of the bad news established in Genesis. Genesis provides a logical foundation for understanding why we need Jesus. If we can't trust what the Bible says in Genesis, how can we believe what it says about Jesus? Now, we have Sabbath school in multiple places. I'd ask you to go to find a friend and follow them into the Sabbath school lesson. Let's pray. Dear Great Father, thank you so much that we can try to see the answers that you gave us in the Bible. Let the Holy Spirit work with us as we answer these questions among the critics. And we thank you in the most powerful name in the universe, Jesus. Amen.